I nowadays give away all my presentations. So if you know somebody back at your workplace who couldn't come to the conference, and yet you think there's some valuable information in here about retrospectives that you'd like to share with the people that you work with, just send me some email, or if you have a USB stick with you, I'll be happy to download everything. I've done that for people who were in my tutorials for the last two days. I'll be happy to do that for you as well, so you can have the presentation. If you don't see me here, and I'll be home on uh, next week sometime, send me some email. When I get home, I'll be happy to email the presentation to you, and you can give it you can change it, you can sell it on the internet, <laughs> you can do whatever you want, okay? So that way you don't have to write down everything, all the quotes and all the URLs and all of that good information. So well, uh, how many of you are doing Agile something? Everybody almost. How many of you are doing retrospectives on the, well, why are you here? <laughs> That's what it's all about, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I mean, that's what retrospect, in fact, that's what Agile is all about. And the way Agile works is to do a retrospective because as we'll see, if you don't, then you're not going to learn. You have to take that time out periodically and stop. Think about what's working, what should be done differently. Now, this session has two parts. Not really. It's one continuous session. But there's going to be a break in the middle. And I think we should try to stay in sync with the other sessions so that if you want to hear one of those other sessions in the second half, this is the law of two feet again. Or if in the middle of the first session or the middle, you want to go hear the other sessions, we'll try to make it easy for you by taking the break at the same time. And also if others want to come in, we'll allow that space for them. So if you're worried about how that's all going to work out, we will try to, I've got people I think, who are watching the time, yes, who will let me know time, and then we'll all take our break together, okay, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, so this is strange, isn't it? Look at that. I can look at myself, <laughs> and I can look at the slides. Can you see that? Can you see the slide? No. Can we do just the slides? Is it possible? Is it possible just to have, I know, you probably worked hard to get that all set up for us, and, and now we're saying we don't like it. Okay, so he's going to, oh, no, not that half. <laughs> we want the other half, so we can, all right, yeah. He, oh, oh, there we go, okay. So there's, there's my contact information you've got. Good, you get that. Well, let's see if this works. Okay, so how many have been out to the Agile Manifesto site or you know about the Agile Manifesto? Okay, I'll, wait, let's ask a different question. Who has never heard of the Agile Manifesto? Oh, good. Or you're afraid to raise your hand and say <laughs> that you don't know about the Agile Manifesto. So we're not sure about the answer to that question, but that's why we're here. <coughs> the Agile Manifesto was created by a bunch of old white guys <laughs> who gathered to think about better ways of developing software. And they came up with some ideas some values. That's kind of unusual for software. Josh gave a great keynote this morning about some things that we value. So for the first time, and I've been in this field for decades, for the first time we started talking about values and principles and practices. 
So the one we're, we're going to look at, or our focus today, is this one. At regular intervals, now that's the first thing that's different right there. At regular intervals, so we were used to doing something like a, a look back on projects. We were used to doing that, but we only did it once. We did it at the end of the project, and now they're saying, no, you need to do this often, and you need to do it regularly. There needs to be, you know, some people describe an Agile project as having a heartbeat. It's a living thing. So there's a regularity to it. You don't wait until the end, although you can still do a retrospective at the end, and you should. And it's different. It's a different kind of practice. But this says we have to do this often. We have to do it in regular intervals. The team reflects. Ah, let's, what does that word mean? Reflect. What does that mean? Look back. Mm, look back. Yeah, that's, I think that's a part of it. It's got another big part. What does it mean? It, it, it does have the idea of a mirror, doesn't it? Reflection. And what does it mean when you reflect? Yeah. To look at yourself. You need to look at yourself. And how are you going to do that? Do we have a mirror in the team room? So we all line up and say, oh, yeah, I need to get my hair cut. Is that how we do it? What enables us to look at ourselves? What's the behavioral characteristic that enables us to do that? Is what? Yeah, and oh, how do we do that? What's involved? I know he knows because he sat through a class with me the day before yesterday. I, we gave some tips. Do you remember those tips? What were the tips about? What were we talking about? Yeah, we, we did talk about influence, didn't we? Yeah, and change, we did. But didn't we also talk about thinking? This is about thinking. I once had a manager ask me, Linda, uh, what, what's this hair programming? I said, well, uh, two people sitting in front of one computer. He said, yes, yes, I get that, I get that. One of them is typing. <laughs> but what's the other one doing? I said, I think the other one is thinking. <laughs> and, and this was in the United States. So he pounded on the table. He said, thinking? We don't have time for that. <laughs> we have deadlines. We're going to get the product out the door. Thinking is a waste of time. I want to see code. Working code, isn't that what it's all about? Working code. It does take time. This is not for free. You do have to stop and think. And that's effortful. So if you think that you're going to be able to do this quickly without any investment, no, no, that's the first justification is why is it worth the time? And we have to take the time to how to be more effective. We want to be better. And how do we do that? So I'm a musician, and when I see this word, tune, tune. Any musicians in the crowd, what do you play? Oh, she's a singer. You don't have to, do you have to tune yourself? La. Yeah, you do have to do a little bit of tuning. Any other musicians? Anybody play a stringed instrument? 
like guitar, maybe? Saxophone. Mm. I, I suppose you can tune it. Can't you use a little bit? Not, you don't want to tune too much. Stringed instruments, especially, they have to be tuned. And if they're not, we can't play together. But tuning is not a major upheaval. It's not a big adjustment. It's a small adjustment. See, I say music, and music appears. Isn't that wonderful? Let me say, lots of money. <laughs> Didn't seem to work quite as well, did it? Um, so tuning is about small adjustments. Tune and adjust. Just small changes. So I'm a believer in the power of small change. You are a complex, adaptive system, as is your software. And small changes can have enormous impact. So the Agile Manifesto says, if we're going to make those small changes in order to know what to do, we've got to stop at regular intervals and think about it. So that's why we're here. And if you haven't read the Agile Manifesto, you can go there and you're going to have my slides anyway, so you don't need to write down that URL. I get this question a lot from people who have been in software for a while. Is that a post-mortem? What does that word mean? It's Latin. What does it mean? Uh, no, it's, it's, what does it mean? What does it Yes. Yes. Post, after, mortem, death, after death. That's what we used to do at the end when the project was over. So what comes to mind when you think of after death? It's a body, isn't it? body lying on a slab, cold and dead. And no matter what we learn, it's not going to help this guy. It's too late. And that's the problem with what we used to do with a post-mortem because we did stop at the end and we did look at what happened and we did try to capture those lessons learned and we did try to save those but it was too late. There's nothing we can do when the, when the project is dead. So if we're going to carry forward with that medical metaphor, wouldn't it be better if we said, hey, let's not wait until we're dead. So I'm incredibly old, and I am tuned to that. I said, yeah, I'm not waiting until I'm dead. Let's learn now. Let's go in and see the doctor, and we'll have a checkup. And he'll say, oh, Linda, your blood pressure's a little high. You've got a lot of stress in your life. Wait, do you have a lot of stress in your life? And he says, you've got to stop that traveling around the world. You need to do some more exercise. You need to watch your diet. Have you ever had that experience? You go in and the doctor tells you, how to make some changes. That have, uh, how many of you do that? Mm, a few. A few or you're lying. <laughs> yes, you're lying. Okay. So, yes. So that's what we're trying to do with our projects. We're trying to have a little checkup. We're trying to say you should take some more vitamins. Let's have some vitamin C or some vitamin D or let's make some small changes while we are still alive with the idea that that will improve our lives, our projects, while they're still running. We're not going to do this because if we wait, it's too late. Now, of course, you should also do a post-mortem at the end of every project. 
I already said that, and I already said it's different. So what Angel brought to the table was learning while the project is still alive. That's what we're talking about. So it's very different from a post-mortem. There aren't too many books about this subject. This is the best. It's a classic. It was written by my good friend Norm Kurth, and I advise you, if you haven't read it, to go out there somehow and find it and read it. It is the best for justifying the practices. It gives you the history. It gives you the psychology. It gives you the rationale, the underpinnings, the understanding about what retrospectives can do for you. It's called Project Retrospectives, and he was talking about postmortems, but everything in there applies to all flavors of retrospectives. So that's my first recommendation. And then, of course, my good friends Diane Larson and Esther Derby said, we're going to build. We're not replacing. We're going to build on Norm's book, and we're going to say what things are different about Agile projects and what things are different about Agile retrospectives. So in order to really take advantage of this, you need to have already read. So there's a prerequisite, I guess, for this book. Norm's book first, and then Esther and Diane's. This is excellent because it says, now we want to do some things differently. So you need both of these. And there's a new book that's just come out. This one is available digitally. It's by my friend Patrick Kua. And he said, I know that Diane and Esther's book is good, but I'm going to add to that. So in this community, at least, they have said, this is good. I'm going to add on to that. And I'm going to add on to that. So these books depend upon one another. They don't. Uh, disparage the work of the others, and they are all good, and they'll all help you do a better job of leading your retrospective. So we've got some three very good books there. Oh, and this is another one of my favorites. Do you know this one, Winnie the Pooh? Does he appear in India? No. Yeah. Actually, Winnie the Pooh has a different name in every country. So that's his English name, Winnie the Pooh. He's a little bear. Christopher Robin is his owner. It's the little boy who takes him everywhere. And here's a picture of Christopher Robin coming down the stairs now. And he has Winnie the Pooh behind him. And it's uncomfortable. <coughs> Winnie the Pooh says, oh, this is how I go down the stairs. Bump, bump bump on the back of my head. Oh, I know, I know there must be a better way. If only I could stop for a minute. If only I could stop bumping and think of a better way. Does that sound like any software projects you know? If we could just stop bumping our heads and think about it. I, if you haven't read the book, you should. There's also a movie if you want to watch the movie. And the penguins are coming, so that's also good. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh and Penguin. How many of you believe this? By going through some experience, I learn automatically. Now, I'm not going to ask this gentleman here because he spent two days with me and we know how the brain works now. So I'm going to ask him, but what about the rest of you? I go through an experience and I learn automatically. That's what I do. My brain learns. How many of you believe that? Ah, okay. So let me pick on you. Have you ever made the same mistake twice? Some, well, what happened there? Ah, okay, I have a friend who's 
been married five times. <laughs> Every time I asked her, I said, Susan, why are you getting married again? She said, oh, this time. <laughs> this time is different. This time, everything will be wonderful. I know this time, I won't make the mistakes I did in the past. So far, it hasn't worked out. She still keeps getting married. Does that remind you of any software projects you know? We'll talk about some research. We'll talk about some experiments that show when you run a little scenario and people make mistakes, and then you let them do it again, they keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. That's really not true. Now, there are some kinds of mistakes that we do tend to learn from, especially as children, if we put our hands on a hot stove. We learn and we carry that with us. So we don't want to do that again. So those visceral experiences, we do seem to learn from. But the kinds of experiences we're having in marriage or in software projects are, for the most part, not visceral, they're mental. We made a mistake in judgment. We made an error in coding or testing. We don't seem to do a good job. Yes, we have accumulated, I like this, experience provides data. And in fact, that's what is the driver in retrospectives, is the data. What happened? We do have to accumulate that information. And looking at that data, then we have to do something else. We have to process that, we have to examine it, and then we have to say, what are we going to do as a result of having had that experience? And not doing that, not stopping and examining that, and picking it up and saying, what are we going to do differently, will lead us to just make the same mistakes over and over and over. That's how our brains work, unfortunately. So this is the data. And again, I will not only send you the presentation, but if you'd like to read the paper. Now, this is a publication by Harvard Business Review. So do not tell the publisher that I'm sending you the paper, OK? But if you want to read about the experiment, what they did was, wait, how many managers in the room? Uh, okay, well, we know managers are very intelligent. <laughs> right? Yeah. So managers were given a, a problem to solve. And in that scenario, they were put under a lot of pressure and things started to go wrong, and the managers, I know it's hard to believe, the managers began to make mistakes. At the end, they asked the managers to look back, and the managers said, oh, I guess, yes, I can see that I did make some mistakes. I know better. I should have. So they know better ways. They know what they should have done. They all agreed that. And then they ran another scenario, another really complicated problem. And then they put on a lot of stress. And things began to go wrong. And what happened? They made the same mistakes. Even though they had just admitted that there was a better way, they made the same mistakes over again. And that's managers, and we know how intelligent they are. So if managers are susceptible to this flaw, what about the rest of us ordinary people? We have the same fallibility. 
So it doesn't work to even know a better way. It's under stress. When things start to go wrong, we make those mistakes over and over. So I'm going to tell you a story about my first retrospective and what I learned that I hope will help you. And while I'm telling the story, I want to invite you a table at a time to come up and look at these funny cards I have on the stage. We'll talk about what the cards are and how you can use this exercise in your retrospective, but I want you all to have a chance to read them, and I know I can't invite you all up. So we're going to start here. You come up, and when they have finished, then let's take the next table, and so you can self-organize based on that little algorithm. Okay, so you come up, and while we're doing that, I'll tell you the story. So I was working in a medium-sized telecom company, and my job was research. I was trying to look at patterns. And I was introducing the gang of four patterns. I was writing some patterns. I was actually writing a book about patterns. All, the whole organization was so excited about this that they said, well, we use patterns for everything. This was a company that produced a giant switch. Switches make telephone calls, or at least they did in the good old days. And this one makes long distance phone calls. It was about 8 million lines of code. And the company knew that it was working perfectly well, but that the lifetime of this switch was, well, coming to an end. They knew that the number of users was diminishing. They knew that their company was in danger of going out of business. So they thought, we have to come up with some new ideas. So they began to spawn some little innovative products, just small experiments. And what they found was that most of them were not doing very well. In fact, the project that was supposed to save the company <coughs> struggled to produce anything. And I don't know if you've ever seen this in a company or not, but we are loss averse. We find losing very painful. And that includes, once we've made a decision about something, we are reluctant to give that up. So in the staff meetings, the executives would say, well, you know, this project isn't doing very well. But we've already spent a million dollars on it, so we can't stop now. Six months later, well, we've already spent two million dollars. We can't stop now. Six months later, well, we've already spent three million dollars. We can't stop now. Six months later, we've already spent four million dollars. And that was at a time when the dollar was really worth something. Finally, they did cancel the project. And they canceled it in January. They canceled it in January, which comes after December. And in December in the US, most of us celebrate Christmas. So what do you think the people on that project were doing over Christmas? Were they taking a lot of time off to spend with their families? What do you think? No, they were not. They were working overtime. In fact, they had been working overtime for two years. So they not only missed Christmas, but they missed all their vacation time and all other holidays. I'm sure that would never happen in India. It happens in the US all the time. So here people were in January. They had worked for two years. And especially, they had just worked over Christmas. Mm -hmm. So how did they feel? So 
my boss came to me after the project was canceled and he said, Linda, this is such a bad experience. I want to make sure that this never happens again. I'll bet there are patterns. Could we find some patterns so that we learn from this? I said, ah, well, sure, we'll do that. I had no idea how to begin, but I had a friend, and his name was Norm Kurth, and I knew that he was writing a book called Project Retrospectives, and it had something to do with looking back and learning, and so I called up Norm, and I said, Norm, help me, help me, Norm, I don't know what to do. And so he gave me some ideas from his book, even though the book wasn't out. He was sharing those exercises. He said, you know, Linda, people don't just get in a room and talk. You don't learn that way. He said, you have to really trick their brains. You have to get them to do something so that all that data is captured somehow. And he said, I'll tell you a good way to begin. It's called a timeline. You make a space on the, maybe the wall, or we've got a stage here. You can do it on the floor. You can do it on the table. And you make a space, and you say, here on the left is the beginning of the project. And then we mark off, say, every month or every six months. And we mark up the time since the project began until the project was canceled. And then we give people some cards or stickies, and we say, what happened on this project? Write that down and put it in the appropriate place on the timeline. And the way I do the timeline now, this was not Norm's idea, I put it on a color and the color means something. The color means how I felt when that event happened. And so when the timeline is done, you can stand back and look at it, and you can see a lot just by looking at the colors without actually reading the cards. You can get a lot of information. It is my favorite retrospective exercise. I encourage you to do it, and I'm going to tell you today a way to do that both for a project, for end of project retrospective, for an agile retrospective, and for what I now call continuous retrospectives. How many of you are moving toward continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery? Yeah, that's our goal. So that means we have to have a continuous retrospective. And the tool that will enable you to do that is this one, the timeline. Something we've been using now for decades. We can adapt it. It's a very adaptable tool. So my team came in and we built our timeline. It was on the wall. It had lots of cards because after all, the project had been running for two years. We had cards about all the things that had happened and how people felt about them. And I said to the team, all right, now the timeline is completed. I want everybody to do what you're doing. Come up, walk that timeline, read all the cards. Seems pretty simple. That's what people are doing here. They come up, they read the cards, they sit down. Easy. They stood up, they went to the wall, they started reading the cards, and then they began to gather in little groups. They'd stand together, and they'd point at a card. They'd touch a card, and they'd read it together. They were remembering some event. 
Then they'd move to another card, and, and, and they would gather in a different little group, and they'd touch that card, remembering. So my war, the war from my history is Vietnam. And if you go to Washington, D.C. today, there's a wall. It's a lot like this. There's a wall in Washington, D.C. It doesn't have events on it. It has names. It has names of people who died in the Vietnam War. It's right in the middle of the city. A big, noisy city. But when you get close to that wall, people are quiet. And they do the same thing that my team was doing. They go up to the wall and they, they touch a name. And they stand there in little groups and they remember. They remember what happened. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I, I just saw them standing and moving and touching cards and talking to each other and gathering in little groups and remembering what happened. And at least I had the grace to take a chair and sit in the corner. And I just waited. And after a long time, they finally sat. But I realized something very important about retrospectives that maybe you don't take advantage of. And when I saw this research, I thought, well, yes, this, this explains it. Oops, there we go. Lots of bad things happen in organizations. And when those bad things happen, we pretend that we are not affected. We pretend that we can go through that bad thing and we can just keep on going. Maybe this is just something in the United States. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't happen in India. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about those bad things. Maybe no bad things happen in India. Well, we have plenty of bad things, and we don't talk about it. So imagine what those guys were going through. You know, having worked for two years, and they knew the project has been canceled, were they excited about going ahead and starting another project? Were they all saying, oh, yippee, I get to start another project, let me add it. Probably not. So the research shows that if you don't have some way of talking about it, if you don't have some way of, well, they say that going through something like that is like carrying a burden, a physical burden on your back. And that if you don't have a chance to put that down, that you take that burden with you on the next project and the next project and the next. So it says it keeps them from moving into the new setting. So on the new project, it keeps them from moving forward with enthusiasm. They just are weighed down. So that's a very good thing that could happen in retrospectives. This is a time when we could talk about it. And maybe we can't talk about it because it's too painful. But maybe we could put it on the timeline. So one of the things I do as an independent consultant is I go into companies and I will lead a retrospective over a project and what do you think those projects look like? Do you suppose some CEO sends me an email and says, Linda, we have had such success. We want you to come in and look at this project because we know there are wonderful things that happen, so we want to know all the good things 
that went right on this project. Do you suppose that's the kind of email I get? No, I, in fact, I've never gotten any email like that, never. Usually the email says, we've got this giant disaster, and I want you to come in here and do a retrospective. And is that executive interested in learning? Does he want to make things better? Is that why he wants me to come in? What do you think? Maybe he might, but what might he also, and it's always a he. <laughs> what might he have in mind? Why does he want to do a retrospective on this massive failure? Yeah, he, he, he wants somebody to blame, doesn't he? He wants to say, who's responsible for this failure? And he doesn't know exactly how to do it, so he thinks, I'll bring somebody in from the outside, and they will help me find somebody to fire. That's not what it's about. And so I explain, a retrospective is about learning. It's not about finding somebody to blame. And it is about, especially for those failed dysfunctional projects, it is about finding a way to bring closure to all of those horrible things. This is a practice that has really nothing to do with software. It comes from the military. <clears throat> military organizations around the world have always done retrospectives because lives are on the line. And they want to make sure that doesn't happen. So again, I'll be happy to send you any of this information, including that other Harvard Business Review article. It's about how all those other military organizations do retrospectives and have been doing it for thousands of years. This is an interesting book. I know you don't have time to read it, but it's the only company I know that hired a monk. They were having so many problems and so many bad things. They said, we need to have an on-site monk and he will help us deal with all of these horrific issues. And the timing for that was wonderful because this is a company that sits right across from Manhattan. And if you stand at the windows of this building, you can look across and see what was the World Trade Center. And people were doing exactly that on 9-11 when terrorist planes flew into the World Trade Center and destroyed that building. They were watching. Oh, it was a good thing the monk was there that day. I don't know. You're probably not going to go out and hire a monk, though, are you? Well, you never know. So what I always tell that executive is, my rule for retrospectives is pretty clear. And this should be your rule as well. You should constantly remind yourself of what Norm Kurth said in his book. We have to believe when we come together to look back and see what happened, whether we're going to write a timeline or whether we're going to have a discussion about what should be done differently, is that we believe that everybody on the team was doing the best job he or she could. Of course, we're better now. We know more now. But we believe that at the time, given their skills and abilities and what they faced, they were all doing the best job they could. And that means we don't ever point a finger at anybody. Norm's rule is no naming, no blaming. That is not allowed in the room. You cannot say, I was okay, but it was that other guy who was working on the database. He's the one who messed things up. Now, of course, you can talk about problems if you want to, 
You can say, yes, we had problems with the database. That's all right. You just can't put a name. You can't say Pramod was the one who screwed up. And you can't name another team either. Well, the developers, we were great, but man, those testers, oh, or those marketing guys, boy, oh, man. So that should be your rule as well. No naming, no blaming. I hear all the time from people who say, Linda, our retrospectives are so boring, all we do is get in a room and complain. So easy to do. And I said, well, do you start with the crime directive? And you say, no naming, no blaming? And they said, uh, we forgot. So put that back in place. You can talk about all the problems you want, but you cannot attach the name of a person or the name of another team. If, of course, if you want to say something good, that's all. And that goes not only for what you say, but for a card on the timeline, or for a note on a flip chart, or any other part of any of exercises you might do. No naming, no pointing of fingers. It's all about assuming that everyone did the best job he could, at least for the sake of the retrospective. But what we know is something interesting that I just heard. The cognitive scientists tell us that there's a little area of your brain, it sits over your right ear. And that's the part of your brain that, at least at the moment, we believe is involved in innovation and creativity. When your brain is involved in coming up with new ideas, exciting different ways of doing something, that's the part of your brain that lights up. Interestingly enough, it is also the same part of your brain that lights up when you get in a room with people and you listen to what they have to say and you think, about what they are thinking. So by gathering and looking back and talking about what happened and listening to other points of view and hearing what other people think, you're exercising the part of your brain that's involved in creativity and innovation. And that means you're now sort of practicing thinking about new ways. So there's another good reason for doing retrospectives. Exercise the part of your brain that will help you be more creative by thinking about what other people are thinking. There are lots of times to do retrospectives. We can do them at the end of a project. We can do them at the end of an interval. We already talked about the heartbeat. We also know that a lot of times companies are going through an agile transformation. Did any of you do that or are you starting to do that? A very good way to begin, and again, I will be happy to send it to you. There's been a giant study that shows retrospectives are a good way to lead agile transformation. Because if you gather and think about, well, what are we doing now? What's really working well for us? What should we think about doing differently? That will give us some ideas for new experiments in our agile transformation. It will inform our decisions about what kinds of changes we can make in our organizations as we move to agile. Instead of just having a meeting with people who are so far removed from the work that they have no understanding of what's actually going on, you actually look at how are we working now and what are the things that we're doing well. Maybe we don't want to touch those right now. Look at areas where we could use improvement. Maybe that's where we should focus our attention as we move to Agile, whether it's 
initiating a new practice, TDD, pairing, stand-ups, whatever, that maybe we won't want to do that wholesale. Maybe we want to decide where to focus our attention by doing a retrospective. So you're being really quiet. I haven't had a single question yet. Is that, do you suppose they are okay? <laughs> I, met, I didn't get through any of my material in the last two days because so many people ask questions. So here are the questions you ask. And I think a lot of times what I see is you don't quite have it right. I think you get the first one right. What's working well that we don't want to forget? Not just every single good thing, but the startling things, the surprising things, the innovative things. We say, wow, that really worked well. Let's not forget that. Now, the second question is where we go astray. The second question most teens ask is, what's not working well? Where are our problems? What are the negative things? That's not the right question. If that's the question you're asking, then no wonder you're drowning in complaining and whining because you just asked for it. You said, where are you having problems? What's going wrong? What are the troublesome areas? Well, I can tell you plenty of those. That second question says, what should we do differently? Whether it's at the end of the project, thinking about future projects, whether it's at the end of the interval, thinking about the next interval, what should we do differently going forward? It is not about focusing on the negative, focusing on the problems. Yes, of course, that is informed by some of those problems, but maybe not. <coughs> So here's another story. I do a lot of traveling and I'm often in a different time zone. I arrive and it's the middle of the night and I'm getting old and I can't remember how to set my alarm clock. Of course, I have my phone. I can use my phone, but I, I make mistakes with that as well. So when I got home from a trip, I was complaining to my husband, I am so stupid. I can't figure out how to set my clock, and I make mistakes on my phone. I had it set a.m. and p.m. I had it backwards. I forgot to turn it on. I guess I should just give up. I just stay home, forget it. Do you ever do that? So my husband is a wonderful guy, and he always does the same thing. He throws everything that I say in presentations back at me. <laughs> he said, Linda, why don't you take your own advice? What are you going to do differently? Stop whining and complaining about your iPhone and your alarm clock. What are you going to do differently? Who wouldn't be happy to be married to a guy like that? <laughs> I don't know. What am I? I feel like I go through the steps. I try to remember how to set the time, and I turn on the alarm, and I kind of think of something to do differently. I got it. I got it. I'll get another clock. And so then I'll have the phone and I'll have two clocks. Surely the odds are that I'll get one of those right. He said, fine, it'll be an experiment. I said, okay. I went to the store, I got another clock, and what I noticed was really, really strange. Because now, with the extra clock, and so I'm setting the phone, I'm setting the two, what I found was that all of them were now right. Now, I cannot explain that. And it doesn't matter. 
And that's exactly what happens on teams. You have a lot of problems. And some of them there is really nothing you can do anything about. And so you should just forget about it. Your focus should be not on the problem because maybe you can't solve it. That, just ask yourself, what are we going to do differently going forward? It's a much more exciting discussion. And what you'll see is the same magic. You will see that somehow doing something different changes everything. And you won't understand why it works. And you don't need to. We used to do an exercise in retrospectives. In fact, I had a class in it called Five Whys. Well, here's the problem. Why do we have that? Well, it's because, it, well, why do we have that? Well, what's this and why? We spend an enormous amount of time in retrospectives going through that. And always we get to the bottom and we say, the problem is our manager is an idiot. What are we going to do about that? That was always the case when you dug deep enough, you were going to get so far away from anything we had any control over. So what good was it? So just shift your focus. Say, all right, we have a lot of problems, I know. But let's think about some things we can do differently going forward. And they do not have to be big. They should just be very small experiments. And then you can ask yourself, what did we learn from that? We learned that somehow our, we can set all the clocks correctly. And what still puzzles us, there are always going to be puzzles, and you should write them down. And anything that comes out of your retrospective, you should make public. And you should post it somewhere where everybody can see it. Often when I go into a company and I do a timeline or a lot of exercises, I see at the end of the day that the executives all come in. And they walk that timeline. And they look at all the flip charts. I once saw a CEO of a large company get down on his knees because he wanted to see a card that was posted on a really deep timeline. He wanted to know the truth. He wanted to hear it. And it made me realize that executives, well, wait a minute, how do executives get information about projects? How do they know what's really going on? How do they? Yeah, they're direct reports, and do the direct reports say, oh, I don't know, I think we're having some problems over there. What do those direct reports usually say? Everything is fine. Oh, yeah. Are we going to deliver on time? Oh, yeah. Are we going to have any problems? Oh, no. Will the customer be happy? Oh, yeah. So he, and it is usually a he, he wants <laughs> to know, and he has no way of getting that information. But if you put your timeline on the wall and share the results of your retrospect, these are all anonymous, of course, he will read what you say. And if you have a puzzle and you post it, he will be happy to read. It's your way of communicating right up the ladder. Use that. That's powerful. So here's the difference. What happens at the end of a project? You look back on that. It's like examining the body. Of course, that's a good thing to do. And it's your intent to say, yes, we had this wonderful project. Here are the things that we learned. Here are some suggestions for doing things differently. You go through the regular set of exercise. That's good. That's a very good thing. But what should Agile projects be doing? And this is unfortunately where we've gotten into trouble. Is we're trying to do exactly that. And that is wrong. 
So the practice we want for Agile projects is not. Let's look back on everything that happened. Let's ask what went well. Let's look at what should be done differently. No. Every small interval, how long are your intervals? How many are doing 30 days? A couple of people, yeah. How many are doing two weeks? Yeah, most people. Anybody doing one week? No, anything smaller than a week? Okay. So are there a lot of companies now that are hours? And at least every two or three hours? That's trending toward continuous delivery. So for whatever your interval is, what you should always be doing is some small experiment. I have one company I'm working with now where they do two-week intervals and they on average do six experiments. So it's a different kind of retrospective. At the end of the interval, what you're asking is, how did that experiment work? How did those six experiments work? How did those three experiments work? So when we say what worked well, we mean what worked well with those experiments. When we say what should be done differently, we mean what new experiments should we do going forward. When we say what puzzles us and what did we learn, we mean what did we get extract that information from those experiments. And by experiment, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning, I mean a real scientific experiment. I mean a real hypothesis. I mean a real plan. I mean real measurement. I mean real analysis. So that when you get to the end of the interval, you can say, we learn from our experiment something that will help us going forward. I have a question, I can't believe it. Be still my heart. Yes? Do we have these action items? Ah, uh, yeah. So the thing about action items is that somebody must own those, and I know the idea is, well, the team owns the action items. And the problem is, well, it's like my friend who's been married five times. Do you remember her? Yeah. yeah. She has good intentions and things are going to be different this time, and then some stressful event happens, and those action items, they don't get done. Maybe your team is different, maybe you're very effective, I don't know, but I'm not a believer in action. I used to do that. So I started doing Scrum in 1994, and in the beginning, I was a believer in the five whys and action items. And what happened over time was nobody did those actions. And after a while, people said, why are we doing this? I, I, I have a point here. Uh, usually when we do these actions, uh, some of the, what we really end up doing is, uh, or, or what, what we end up assigning in these actions is some of these experiments, right? It could be, yes. An action item could be an experiment, yes. I think what, I'm, what I'm liking from this, from this uh, slide is the word experiment has got a very exploratory Absolutely. Action yeah. tends to be a little more Yes. I it to you. Ab absolutely. Okay. In, in fact, that, that's a, an important issue. That whatever it is that you're trying to do in your organization, choose your words carefully. And in some organizations, just saying the word experiment is something you would not want to do because it implies that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> well, we don't know whether this will work or not. So we're just going to do a little experiment. And if some manager at some level hears that you're doing experiments, that you're wasting time on things that might not work out, they're going to be very upset. So sure, if you want to call it action items, that's <coughs> fine with me. But they are, they really are experiments. The other thing I hear from teams is our retrospectives are boring. All we do is get in a room and we answer the same thing and people complain and we do the same exercises and it's so boring. Well, of course, 
But experiments? Ah, now, that's exciting. And I get to think in a scientific manner. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning, so I don't want to give too much away, but we're not often given the chance to be scientists. And science is how we make progress. It's not a debate, so the strongest person win. It's about a hypothesis and testing that hypothesis with a real experiment and then doing some analysis and learning so that you can build on that and go forward. And you're not endlessly talking about the same thing over and over and over. We're still having the debate about whether we should do code reviews or pair testing. We've been debating code reviews for decades. We should just do some experiments. So I'm okay with calling it an action item. Thank you for that, because that's very good. Language. Language always matters. Yes. Another question. Could be, could be. I'd be, I, I, I'm open to that. I just have never seen it be very productive time. But if it works for you, so I, um, I know I've said this before, but I'm old, I'm incredibly old, and I'm pragmatic. And I know that we have very little proof for almost everything we do. The software business is notorious for following fads, getting on the latest bandwagon, following the silver bullets. We love silver bullets. So if you say it works for you, I say do it. As long as it's working, as long as it's useful, what you're doing is as useful as what I am seeing now. And I say, wonderful, do it. Yes. There was another thought, oh, yes. Good, what are these questions? You were just waiting for somebody, weren't you? Yeah. Before coming to this session, um, I have always had this impression, and I read a lot of blogs and the uh, case books from the Red Guru, where they say a retrospective always results in an action. Nonsense. <laughs> and well, wait a minute. We're calling experiments actions, right? That was his idea. Yeah. That is an action. And the team decides to choose the most, uh, I mean, the most the action which could give the most benefit to the, uh, the creation of the project team with lesser uh, effort. So there's two things, I look at the two action items in the top of the list they would want to follow in the future iteration. Right, so I'm sure you didn't hear what she had, she's very soft spoken, but she's saying a retrospective should result in actions and we're gonna call experiments actions, so I'm good with that. And then she said there could be a prioritization because we wanna make sure that our effort is spent with the most benefit given the effort that we have to exert. And certainly we know that teams have limited time and that we should, we could examine all the possibilities for experiments going forward and say, you know, this one is really cheap and easy and we can get a lot of information from that. So certainly that could be part of it. If you have too many things, my experience is that the team puts things out there that they really want to do and they just happen. But you're, you're absolutely right. Just like the gentleman over there, we should call them actions and there might be a sense of prioritization. And we might have examined some problems along the way in order to determine it. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes. So there are agile coaches who teach that what happens in a retro stays in a retro. And the previous slide you mentioned that you should probably go ahead and share it with everybody. Absolutely. So, I mean, there are coaches who actually, you know, teach this, that, uh, you know, it stays within the team because you have honest opinions, you have things. Hmm. So, as you said, we may not be able to do something about some problems, but at least we've uncovered those. So yeah. How do you relate the two? So, so maybe in, uh, there might be environments where teams don't feel they are safe. 
And of course, we know that uh, one of the guidelines for retrospectives is that all comments should be anonymous. You can say anything you want. Well, actually, you cannot. No naming, no blaming. So you can't say anything that you want, but that it's all anonymous. If you had a chance, has everybody been up to look at the timeline? Okay. There is no name on any of the cards. Yes, we could look at the handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> some people do that, I suppose. And if there are colors, some people write in colored pens, you might be able to see. So if that's describing your environment, you might want to think about that. Absolutely. All of these are recommendations that fit in a context. But the other thing I would say is that you might be surprised that you're not as unsafe as you might believe and that there might be benefits in sharing and would be worth an experiment. You could try some kind of sharing because I believe that once you start doing experiments, and other teams hear that you're doing experiments, and they say, I want to know what happened with your experiment. So I once did some research in knowledge management. Do you know what that is? Okay, we have a knowledge management system. So you have a big database, and it has knowledge. Lots of people like that because they want to put knowledge in. But nobody ever wants to take knowledge out. So those enormous projects were failures. And I then learned something interesting. I said, it's just imagine that some group of people in your company had a secret meeting, high level executives perhaps had a secret meeting, and maybe they were going to decide something momentous like, whether people were going to be fired or not. Does that ever happen in your kind of secret? Secret. And when the meeting is over, people in the room are told, do not tell anybody <coughs> what happened in this meeting because it's a secret. So here's the question. How long does it take before the information from that meeting is spread across the entire company? How long before everybody knows the secret? How long does it take? A day. It depends on the organization. It depends on the organization. But it happens pretty quickly, doesn't it? So how does that happen? Did they all go to the knowledge database? Did they look at the knowledge? No, they talked to each other. People talked to each other. I looked at Josh's app today for rewarding people. We have to have an app for rewarding. Why can't I just go up to you and say, hey, thank you for doing, why can't we just say thank you person to person? Why can't, that's where all the power of communication and anything is, is my talking to you. And that's exactly what should happen with retrospectives. If you don't talk about it, if you don't share the results of your experiments, if you don't somehow make public what your team is learning, isn't that what it's about? Learning. If we don't share it, if we put a wall around it, well, then all that learning is lost to the rest of the organization. So I'm not looking at the time. Are you looking at the time? You are? Are we okay? We haven't had our break yet? Oh, we're just keep, we're, we didn't have a break. You didn't have a break. <laughs> I promised them they'd have a break, and now you're making me look like a liar. So is the break over? Do you miss the break? And, oh. All right. Okay, no, no what, 
what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take a break right now. We're going to take a very short break. Yeah, so let's, let's take, uh, I don't know, seven and a half minutes. So go outside, go to the restroom or do whatever, or come back. You've got to have a break. You can't just sit here. And I'll stand right here if you want to come up and talk about anything. And then we'll come back and talk about our experience. Yeah. Wait, let me take this off. Some of you, I can see other people in the room now who were in my tutorials for the last two days. I try to advocate not sitting. And that sitting is very bad for us. And in fact, there is a study that shows the longer you sit every day, the sooner you will die. <laughs> I pay attention to research like that. <laughs> so I stand up. I try to stand up. Now I know some people are not comfortable with standing when we can't stand very long. But see, he learned. Look at that. <laughs> he was standing. Yes. So we should allow that. We should allow people who say, that's enough. I'm tired of sitting. I want to go stand up. That's absolutely a good thing to do. So now we need to pick up and we're, we're not going to miss lunch. Yes. Okay, we're not going to miss lunch. So we, we have talked about maybe I'll have to change the name now. You know, these action items are really experiments. And so that's the purpose for Agile Retrospectives is to do some small experiment in the next iteration. Now, the question is, well, where do those ideas come from? And often I have seen that in Agile teams during the daily stand-up, what held you up yesterday? Something. Hey, that gives me an idea for an experiment. Well, how can we capture those good ideas? And the answer is the timeline, which is an exercise that can be done in a project retrospective at the end of a project and is put on the wall or on the floor or on a table is usually built during the retrospective. Is that, and how many have used a timeline at all and is that how you do it? During the retrospective, you build the timeline. Yes, that's an exercise during the retrospective. But now I coach my agile teams to build the timeline as it happens. So you don't wait until the end of the, let's use two weeks as an example, you don't wait until the end of the two weeks before you start building the timeline. You build it as it happens. So as events occur over the course of the two weeks, people are picking up cards and writing them and putting them on the timeline, it's real time. It's a real time timeline. It's being built as the events happen. And that's not only good because then you don't forget, because even you, all you young, energetic people, even you forget, don't you? Maybe, sometimes, yeah. What happened two weeks ago? So it avoids that problem. It also affords us a chance to capture those ideas. They come up during stand-ups. They come up when we're stuck on a problem and then we think, ah, I've got an idea for an experiment. Let me go put that on the timeline. So when we're ready to do the retrospective, we just quickly look at the timeline, which has already been built, and we pull out ideas that are there for experiments that might give us some ideas for other experiments. So the best way to start doing experiments on your Agile projects is to build the timeline in real time. So you need to find a place. I don't know where it's going to be, a wall, a conference room, some place where you can 
have this timeline going all the time, and people can post cards to it. Now, the wonderful thing about it is, if you have a safe environment, other people could walk by, and they could see something as it happens. Let's perhaps open the possibility that maybe we could even do something about it. So when you came up, did you notice that there were different colors of cards? And across the top, did you see what those colors mean? Those are just my choices. You can use any colors you want. But when people look at the colors of the cards, what cards stood out for you? What cards did you tend to focus on? Or did you notice? What color was that? Pink? The pink or the red. Why is that? Why do we go for the dirt, you know? Yeah, that's the anger, that's the frustration. And not only that, when we read them, we thought, yeah, yeah, I know how that is. Did you see the one? Let's see. Oh, here it is. Yeah, at the end. I quit. <laughs> so these cards come from a lot of classes in retrospectives where I say, pretend that you're doing a retrospective on your last project. So the, this is not from a company. If I go into a company, I have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I can't walk out with their cards. So this, these are from classes, but I say, imagine, remember that project. So they are from real people who were thinking about what happened on real projects and it's amazing, isn't it, that it looks like it could have come from a team working together on a project, or maybe it could have come from your team. Because most of these comments are things that we do here from everybody. So you can use any color you want. I choose red or pink. This means anger or frustration. Blue means happy. Green, challenge, yellow, surprise, but you, you can use different colors, you can use different feelings or emotions, but even when you stand back, you get a lot of information from the timeline just by looking at the colors. So you should always start your retrospective with ground rules. Here are some, and of course that would include Norm Curse Prime Directive, no naming, no blaming. And we talked about this earlier. There were some people who came up to ask a question over the break. Who facilitates? And the answer is, it cannot be somebody on the team. Now, you don't have to bring in somebody like me from the outside, but you do have to bring somebody from outside the team. And often what I see is two teams that kind of work together. And a member of one team will come in and facilitate a retrospective from the first team, and vice versa. So you have a little reciprocal arrangement there, and you should all take turns. Facilitating a retrospective is an interesting experiment, and also it's a good way to share information. So if team A sends a facilitator over to team B, well, they're going to see that retrospective, and they're going to take advantage of all the information that comes up. They're going to learn. And in fact, if you start spreading that role around, not just with two teams, but maybe three or four teams, then that's a good way of sharing information because I facilitated your retrospective. I learned what you did with your experiments or your action items. I can take that back to my team. In fact, I could take that on to the next retrospective I facilitate. It's a learning experience taking on that role. But don't expect a scrum master or a member of your team to do both facilitation and participation. It is impossible. The facilitator of the retrospective has to follow the agenda, creates the agenda, make sure the time is followed so that we don't miss our breaks or our lunch. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't pick on you. That's, that's just a good thing. So here are some exercises. We've talked about the timeline, and I'm a firm believer in feeding people. So you should always have food at your retrospectives. 
And even if your company says, no, we don't have a budget for that, we can't, take turns. Take turns bringing in some, it doesn't have to be elaborate or expensive. It could just be some nice cookies or I don't, I don't know, whatever would work for you. Because as we learned in the last couple of days, food is a powerful influencer. And there's plenty of research that shows when we share food together, we are more open, we're more trusting, we do a better job of listening. So for the price of a few cookies, you can get a much more effective retrospective. So I don't know what it would be here in the United States. It would be the big chocolate chip cookies with the big chocolate chips. <laughs> so the lesson I learned, and again, we talked about this yesterday, do not bring in healthy food. <laughs> If you show up with whole wheat fig newtons, everybody is going to say, what is this? I don't like whole wheat. It has to be something that everybody likes. And so it's a festive occasion. Sharing food, it's more enjoyable. And it's deep in all our cultures that having some nice food <coughs> means that we're happier. And we know when we're happier, we're more productive. So we should absolutely have food. So we're going to look at the timeline. Here's a picture of a timeline that was given to me by a manager of a team in Houston. We did this retrospective, and then he said, I was entering all the data from the cards. And he said, I thought I'd share this with you. It's a little snapshot of this Excel spreadsheet. I thought this was a little too much managing, but nonetheless, it made him happy. It just shows you what you can see from a project without reading anything on the cards. What do you timeline. notice? What do you notice about the timeline? Yeah. Challenges become anger. Challenges become anger. And, well, well wait, how does it start? Happy. Yes, look at that. Everybody's happy. Oh, yeah, your project. <laughs> and also not too much. Hardly any cards. Look when this started. This is 2001, and we did this retrospective in 2004. Nobody remembers. This is not just a two-week interval. This is a long project. So waiting till the end has the penalty that nobody's going to remember what the heck happened. But we do know we were happy. Those of us who do remember anything, remember those little happy moments and we were so excited when we got going. And then, uh-oh, some challenges. And often the same event can be a challenge and also a source of anger or frustration. It just depends. So we have a few challenges. Uh-oh, some red cards. Uh-oh, more challenges. Whoa. Lots of red there to the end. I once did a retrospective for another team in Houston, and we finished. And I always ask people to stand back a little and look at the timeline and tell me what you see. So for this particular team, everybody finished the timeline. They stood back, and they looked. And I said, what do you see on the timeline? because it was all red. Every single card was anger or frustration. What a project that must have been. So they stood, they looked at the timeline. Finally, one young gentleman in the front row went up, he picked up a blue card and he wrote and posted it at the very end. And he said, thank God it's over. <laughs> you can see a lot from a retrospective if you just look at colors. So I want you to think about experiments. I want you to be able to start doing 
experiments. And it might take a little bit of practice, so we're going to have a look at how experiments are run. But before that, did we have a question about the timeline? Yes, we did. You can always do a retrospective and look back and learn. And it, you know, you don't have to wait till then. It would have been better for this team, certainly. It would have been better for the team with all the red cards if they hadn't waited until the end. that a retrospective has a flow. And if you're going to do a retrospective after three years, there are other things that you would do besides the timeline. Uh, if you look at Norm's book, he has lots of um, tricks and exercises that will help you remember. One of them is called the artifacts game. And you ask the team to clean out their desk and bring in a real object that reminds them of something from the experience they had. And they'll bring in the original requirements document. They'll bring in the t-shirts they gave at the kickoff project. They'll bring in a board if, if there's any hardware. They'll bring in the first version of the, the prototype of the hardware board. They'll bring in all kinds of things. And people will gather around those objects and they'll say, oh yeah, I remember now. And then they'll put a card on the timeline. So there are other exercises that can go on at the same time to make sure that we do remember as much as possible. Is that, is that okay? All right. So here's how we do an experiment, just, just in case. Okay. So we're going to start by asking a question. How, what can we do differently about this? Or I wonder about that. We might do a little research. What are other companies doing? Maybe there's research to show whether or not this is a good idea. And then you have a hypothesis. You want to test that hypothesis in your experiment. How would we test it? How would we show whether or not this hypothesis is true or not? And then do your experiment, collect the data, and analyze it. Sometimes that can be a simple process, sometimes very complicated. And then share the results with others. So I'll give you an example. So I do a lot of interaction with, I don't consult there, but I'm very good friends with the CEO of Menlo Innovations. Have you, any of you heard of Menlo? It is the most agile company on the planet. You should go to MenloInnovations.com to see how an agile company is run. And they do experiments all the time. So I was talking to Rich Sheridan in Singapore. We were both doing talks there. And he said, Linda, I'll give you a good example of an experiment. He said, you talk a lot about standing. And I do. In the class that I gave a couple of days ago, I said, it's not just me now. You can go out and buy furniture that will allow you to stand up. Some of that furniture will allow you to walk. You can have a treadmill desk or a standing desk. Now the problem is those are really expensive. So at Menlo, someone had been reading the research. At Menlo, someone had said, you know, this could be a good idea, but I don't know. So there's the question. I don't would this work for us? So we said, I don't want to spend a lot of money buying a treadmill desk or a standing desk. Let's find a way to test this hypothesis that it would be a good idea to stand up. Let's find a way to test that without spending a lot of money. In fact, when you look at your experiments, we had somebody call us on that, it should not involve a lot of investment and it should have a big return. So at Menlo, they say they should be cheap. How can we do a cheap experiment? 
<coughs> so the team said, I know what we can do. We'll go get some cardboard boxes. We'll bring them in. And when we feel like standing, we'll just pick up our laptops. We'll put the box on our desk. We'll put the laptop on the box. And we'll stand. And we'll see how we like that. How does that work for us? How do we feel at the end of the day? The kind of data we could collect would be, do you think you are more energetic, less tired? Do you like standing up? Do you feel like you're doing something instead of just sitting, sitting, sitting all day long? It's subjective data, but data nonetheless. And then volunteers, who wants to try the experiment? So about half the team did. So they had six people who brought in boxes. And over the course of the next iteration, the next two weeks, they had boxes on the desk. And they were standing up. And they were trying, standing, sitting, standing, sitting. And at the end, they surveyed those six people. And they found they liked it a lot. And they felt more energetic. And they thought maybe their back pain was going away. And that maybe they felt at the end of the day they weren't so tired that they actually, because they were standing, felt more energetic. So they said, okay, let's take the next step and let's buy some of that furniture. And they grew it. Little steps, little steps. Other teams experimented, other teams did things, other teams all, it seems, moved over to standing desk. And what Rich Sheridan, who's the CEO, told me, he said, that goes on all the time. We always have cheap experiments running. And you should too. That's what Agile is all about. And it's not just enough for your organizations. I want to talk about your life. You should be doing that in life. Just like I did with my alarm clock. What can you do better? And you should ask yourself that periodically. At the end of every day, at the end of every week, at regular intervals, you should stop and say, how can I be more effective? How can I tune and adjust my life? so that I can be more effective. Okay, he's giving me my, my signals now. So here's a lot of advice. They should be cheap. They should be small. Don't try to solve all the problems in the world. We call that boil the ocean. No. Little tiny things. Little tiny. And sometimes, I see in retrospectives, somebody will put a card on the timeline and all of a sudden the problem goes away. Magic. You should do something with it. That depends on your culture. That depends on your organization. That depends on how comfortable your team feels. How safe. We heard a wonderful keynote today. That's something that's very important. How safe do you feel? But realize that if you're not sharing what you've learned, you're keeping that information, which is valuable, from the rest of your organization. Find a way around that. Okay. We're, we're almost out of time. You, you, this is something you'll have when you uh, ask for my slides. But it's from a new book by uh, Robert Sutton and Huggy Rao. It's called Pre-Morta. And it's a rather elaborate technique for let's not wait until the end of the project to do a post-mortem or an examination of the project. Let's do it before we run it. And maybe that would help us decide whether we even want to do the project. <coughs> so it's a technique for looking at the scenarios that you would run to say what worked well on this project even before we've done it. Where did things go wrong? <coughs> With the idea that you could either anticipate those or say, you know, there's enough here that we have to worry about that. I'm not sure we should go down that path. So pre-mortem, or I've also heard it called future perspective. Look into the future and anticipate 
by asking the same questions and doing the same exercises, run the timeline, what happened first, and then what do you think will happen six months out, and what will happen before the end of the practice. Anticipate those events. So he's yelling at me now and he's saying we gotta get out of here. Okay, so we know that these are important and if you need convincing, one of the things you can do is you can buy the wonderful book that I wrote called Fearless Change. You wanna introduce anything. Once you've got these experiments and you have great ideas and you say, well now let's get that idea going across the organization, there are patterns for doing that in Fearless Change. So I recommend that book as well. We talked about facilitation. Most developers or technical people that I know know nothing about facilitation. So I've collected a lot of resources. Many of these are free online places you can go to learn about facilitation techniques. And the absolute best book is the one at the bottom, Gene Tabaka's book called Collaboration Explained. A retrospective is a meeting and often we waste an enormous amount of time in meetings. We need to do a better job of that. So I recommend it highly, not just for retrospectives, but for facilitating any meeting at all. Did you have a comment? Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say for this network distributed teams, for the distributed teams like uh, you conducted in your Oh, wow. That's a, that's a whole other topic. But I, you know, I definitely believe you can run successful retrospectives for teams. You can do everything that we've done here using uh, an enormous uh, set of tools. But it, one thing that's often left out of retrospectives for distributed teams is the food. <laughs> we need to have food. So what I do is I have the team say in India has a recipe for some really nice Indian dish. And they send it to us, and we all go to the grocery store, the Indian grocery store, and we buy those spices, and we make that dish, and we are all eating it at the same time. And we say, ah, oh, this is good. I'm not sure, did I have enough of some kind of spice? And then we'll hear how your mother made it, and how your wife makes it. And now we feel a little closer to you and a little more understanding of what your culture is like and we learn about each other. And that's a big part of retrospectives and it should be there for distributed teams as well. So find a way of sharing food. Okay, he's really yelling at me now. So buy Norm's book, <coughs> get Diana and Esther's book. Patrick's book, if you go to my website, I've written a lot of stuff about retrospectives. You can download all that for free. And there is a Yahoo group, retrospectives at yahoo.com. And the people who hang out there are the people who've written the books and the people who are really interested in retrospectives and retrospective facilitation. And it's a great place to go with your questions because you'll hear from people all over the world who mostly have either been through what you're going through or would love to discuss it with you, have advice for you, suggestions for you. So go hang out there, you'll learn a lot. And I hope that maybe you've gotten a few ideas. You're gonna start trying some experiments. Will you try some experiments? Good, okay, so if you will do that, let me know how that works for you. Tell me what interesting and exciting experiments you're doing so that I can share those with others because sometimes people get stuck. And I, so I always have to talk about Menlo Innovations, but I would love to talk about what you're doing. So thank you for staying with me and skipping your break. And yeah, it's been fun. Thank you so much.